All right. Let me just check that we are live. And we are live. All righty. And let's just wait a little bit for followers to start coming. In the meantime, I am going to show our latest followers. Um, wait. There. So let me share my screen. It's also like almost the end of December. <laughs> it feels weird. All right. So I remember reading Shadow Devil, Wolverine. Uh, oh, I even read Curity. So I guess we have just one more follower, Yalame, uh, that followed us yesterday. So thank you for following us. Uh, remember, if you go to twitch.tv slash mulesoft underscore community, you will be able to follow this Twitch stream. You can just create a Twitch account and you will be able to receive notifications as soon as we are live and also to see all of our previous recordings, our schedule um, and so on. So it's better if you just go and create an account there. Oops. And I just went to the other screen. All right. So yeah, we're getting people. Hello. Hey, Whitney. Hi. All right. Hi, Thomas. Awesome. So we're getting people already. Um, so Yannick, what's up right. uh, about you? Are you a mentor? What's up with you? Hi, so uh, I'm Yannick Menager. Uh, I am a MuleSoft mentor. Uh, I've been, uh, I'm the founder of CloudTech and Eontronics. Uh, so I've been involved in MuleSoft uh, since 2017. Uh, and actually all those years I've been exclusively working with Salesforce. Well, and before Salesforce, MuleSoft itself as a, a solution architect. So I've been doing a lot of MuleSoft work. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what are we going to see today? So here I'm going to be presenting the Enhanced Mule Tool Suite. So this is something I've been working on since 2017. Uh, so it started just with one tool, which was uh, Enhanced Mule Tools. Uh, which before that was called AnyPoint Tools. So it's uh, an automation in order to be able to do provisioning of uh, API manager. So that's how it started. But in the meanwhile, I kept adding feature feature, uh, mostly to solve gaps that I had in different projects with different customers. Uh, so here there's a website with the documentation, so docs-mule.com. Um, so I'm going to start by going over Enhanced Mule Tools. So Enhanced Mule Tools has a command line. Uh, so you can install the command line tool on your machine. So in the documentation, you'll actually have the different you know, download links. Or if you, host, if you use Homebrew on Mac, it's very easy. Just run two commands. Uh, but actually installing the command line tool is optional. So you can optionally just run this Maven command. So if you have a machine where you can't install things, you could actually just run Maven and that's it. You get this shell. Uh, so that, that shell has all the exact same capabilities, but, but having the command line tool is a bit more easy. So EMT and actually EMT can also run the shell. The shell is nice because you get autocomplete. So let's get out. So main thing so this has a lot of features uh, like i was saying every time there was a little gap uh, i would add things so just to give a few examples uh, be able to uh, uh, what's going on here it's not opening oh yeah uh, things like cloud hub for example if you're deploying on cloud hub and you want custom logs uh, with a standard Maven plugin. You can't do that. This supports it. Uh, or, for example, one uh, one quirk of uh, deploying via Maven uh, is it if you pass properties, it always overrides all properties. So that means that for all practical purposes, being able to come here and put in your own properties no longer works. Uh, so EMT is smarter. It will merge them. So there's too many 
of the small features to go over. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the big ones. So here to demonstrate, um, I'm going to create an API. So I'm going to do this the classic way, which is to create from an API that is in Exchange. So from Exchange, so let's go. So I already have here a spec published to Exchange, which is this my API. So one of the things that I've really been focusing with Enhanced Mule Tools is to make it really easy uh, and, and try to avoid all the little inconveniences. So here, so now, I have a project, so I could do the setup the hard way by making all the modifications. Uh, so again, there's in the documentation in setup, you'll see manual setup, but you don't want to do manual setup. It's easier to just use again EMT. So let's go to my spec and then I'm just going to EMT application enhance. Or the shorted version EMT app ENH. So that's it. So that's done all the setup of the project. If I come back on the project and I do F5, you'll see now everything is set up. So if I we come here, you'll see so there's enhanced mule properties, which we'll go over later, and there's now the enhanced mule tool plugin. So now the, the main thing that this has here is you'll see this anypoint.json. So it contains deployment parameters. So all the deployment parameters are contained here. So you can see for Cloud Hub, for RTF, uh, and a bunch of other things you can configure. So actually, that's that one I was talking about. So merge existing properties. So that's also in here. Uh, and also override. So to make deployment easier, you can set up properties here. And then here you have the ability to set up for say environment type production and then have a different set of properties so that allows you to create you know different configurations per environment so now let's look so i'm going to open this actually with intellij um, you don't have to um, you can use anything but the reason i'm doing this is uh, this file has as you see here as a schema so if you use something like IntelliJ, you get autocomplete. Uh, once it's finished loading, yeah, you get autocomplete. So that's nice. So I'm going to go over the main functionality here, which is auto provisioning of API manager. So here uh, I've also made this as smart as possible and not to have to duplicate information. So because I've created this from an API, so we'll see here uh, in Maven, you'll see it has the API spec. It's going to actually identify that and pick that up. So I don't need to repeat myself kind of thing. Um, put again all the parameters. So I'm just going to put the API. So now what do I want in my API? Well, I want an SLA tier. So I'm going to come here, I'm going to call this standard. So you need limits. So one request per millisecond. So I want an SLA tier. What else do I want? I want policies. Um, so policies now here is a bit more tricky because policies, the JSON comes from, uh, from the policy. So I can't put that as part of my schema. Uh, and it will vary between each policy. Each policy has its own configuration, et cetera. Um, and they're not documented. So that's actually the biggest problem. So to, you could come here and use, like in the old days, that's what we would have to do to figure out the JSON is go to developer tools and see what JSON is being sent. Uh, I've actually added EMT a, a little command to make that easier. So for example, uh, if I wanted a client ID enforcement, pretty typical. So I already have here an API uh, that has client ID enforcement. So I'm just going to do EMT API manager dump sandbox. And this will actually go through all the APIs that I have in Exchange and dump their policies. 
So see here, it found the existing API and there it is, there's the JSON that I need. So I can just copy that. Uh, and then once you do it the first time, then it's easy because you can copy it between projects. So, so I've just added now the policy for uh, client ID enforcement. So if I wanted to change, you know, for example, those, I could come here and change this. So we have an SLAT, we have a policy. Now what else would we want? So let's just say that actually I want to access this existing API. Uh, that's actually one of the most time consuming and more important than time consuming error prone part. Because uh, if you have one API that needs to access, say, two, three other APIs, uh, then you need to go and go inside exchange, go here, uh, request the access for each of the APIs, create your application, go copy your client ID, copy your client secret. And then if you have like five APIs, that's, it's a lot of clicking and copying client IDs uh, and then multiply by the number of environments that you have. Uh, it, it's it's really insane. That's actually what started me having to create this whole project is we had a, a customer, Petco actually, which had like 50 something APIs and this whole process was becoming completely out of hand, uh, especially with people making mistakes, copying the values and then things break and then you have to spend time figuring out why it's broken. So that that's what really started uh, creating this tool. So, uh, so in here, let's go back. Um, uh, so I want to access and uh, I want a client application. That's it. There's my client application, and I want to access. So I need. So I want to access this existing API. So I need a group ID, and I need an asset ID. Good. So now I have all those things. So now, now of course, this is an API, so I need uh, to add uh, auto discovery. So again, auto discovery is a bit of an inconvenience the way it's been done because here I'm going to have the API created manually. So I can't, I don't want to do this so manually, automatically. So I don't want to have to do manually to get my API ID. Um, so the option, of course, would be I could add auto discovery, but then I need to come in here and run configuration and disable gatekeeper. Now, that's one of the things, one of my uh, fundamental uh, preferences, let's just say, uh, is I like projects that build out of the box. So one of my objectives has always been you should be able to check out a project, click on run, and it works. Uh, and you'll probably notice in most customers, most projects you'll have, you don't see that. It's always, oh, I'm going to have to go and add like 10 different things to uh, to my application just so that it can work. So now here, everything runs by default. So how did I solve that problem? Uh, enhanced Mule Tools. So Enhanced Mule Tools can actually add um, auto discovery. So it's a parameter. So you have to add it. It's not by default. So add auto discovery. True. Uh, and now I do need to put in the flow because the default is API main. Uh, so it's actually called my API main. So I need to set the default. So that's it. So now when, when I run it locally, I will not have auto discovery. So it, it's not going to block. Uh, but when it deploys, it will add auto discovery. So we are now ready to deploy this application. Now, deploying means that I need to be able to inter log in to to any point uh, and as you guys might be familiar doing that outside studio is a problem uh, before the problem only happened if you had single sign-on but now because you have um, a multi-factor authentication forced uh, it's now a problem that affects everyone so people have different workarounds for this uh, so sometimes they'll create a connected apps and give everyone the same connected apps of course, that's a security disaster. Uh, or you know, developers will come here and again, you know, open developer tools, find your bearer tech token, set your bearer token. Uh, that's what also I, I used to do, have to grab the bearer token and then set it. So actually EMT, you could 
get a bearer token and then set it using this command so it would save it uh, but I've, I've got now a better option which is EMT login so that will do the login so here I'm already logged in so it's not actually going to ask me to log in yeah, it's running on the lambda function so the when it's shut down it takes a while to start up uh, so that's it so I'm logged in, I have credentials. So that means uh, let's rename this application so that it doesn't conflict with the spec name. Uh, okay. All right, so API. Okay, so now I can do Maven deploy. It's build application. So see now here already we have the Maven saying it added auto discovery. And so it's pretty verbose. So I've added a lot of information which can be useful to find out, for example, if you deploy to the wrong environment. So it tells you. Uh, and here you see it's provisioned the spec. So it's create the API, set the policies. SLAT. So it tells you all the things it's done. It shows you all the configuration it's used. So one worker, micro version of Mule. So those things are all useful. And now it, it's deploying running applications. So let's go have a look at what happened. So as you see, now I have this My API. And it has the SLAT. It has the client ID policy. Uh, and it, it went into existing API and it requested access. So there we have, we have the contract. So all of that was automatically provisioned. And then when you deploy it somewhere else, uh, it will provision everything. So it's on demand at the time of deploying to a server. Um, and now, like I said, you could use override. So I could actually have an override. Uh, so that if I deploy to production, I would get you know, a different policy, for example. So you can do that here via this uh, anypoint.json overrides. So now let's look to another interesting part, which is my application. So there it is. It's deploying. Now let's look at the properties. So all of those were actually set up by uh, Enhanced Mule Tools. So let's look at the interesting one. So see here, any point API ID, there it is. So this API that was provisioned, let's find the API. Uh, so not the existing API, this one. So my API, if you look, so that ID that you would have to normally manually copy, that's it, it's done automatically. Um, yeah. Wrong place. There it is. So it's been copied. Now, because I've requested the client uh, client application, and you'll see here any point API client secret and any point client ID. So that was automatically injected into the properties. Uh, and then all those other ones are conveniences. So the any point platform client ID is injected. The client secret is injected if you have access. Uh, so this needs to retrieve from some APIs and not not everyone has access. So you you might actually not have this depending on your the access of your user. Uh, and then things like org name, m suffix, org ID, env name, env type. So they're convenient. So all of those get injected in the application. So now we have fully working application and everything deployed. Now let's look at uh, another interesting feature. So another way to do an API is actually to have your spec in the project. Now, uh, your soft uh, no, always recommends API first so that you have your API spec published. But th there's a number of valid reasons why you would do that. 
Uh, so for example, if you have a spec that you, you don't really know what you're integrating with and it's going to be changing a million times before it's stable, uh, you, you want your spec in here, not to have to publish every time your spec, uh, especially in Exchange, Exchange doesn't support snapshots. So every, you would have to increase. So you, you'd go to prod instead of going in 100, you'd go with like 10512. That's not good release management wise. So here we have, and actually it's now even the default in, in, in studio. So download RAML from Design Center. So now if you do this, so I'm going to get this other API spec. So other API. So now this application, I couldn't actually normally in, in, in new, if you're doing normal mule development, you couldn't add API manager to this application because to add API manager, you need a spec. And in this case, in spec in exchange, and in this case, I don't have a spec in exchange. I have a spec in my project. Uh, so that use case actually enhanced mule tools also supports. So if I come into my project, so CD other API, uh, let's uh, EMT uh, PNH. And now I can just do Maven deploy. So what this does is in this case, when your spec is in your application, it's going to automatically deploy the spec to Exchange. Uh, and in fact, you can even have it uh, add all, all the information you see in Exchange. So things like tags, things like pages, uh, you can actually set all of that in your application. So you could have an application that automatically sets up here a spec with everything all nicely documented, all nicely cataloged. So here you see, and it said, you know, the spec is in there, it's publishing. Now Exchange, like I mentioned before, doesn't support snapshots. Um, it has something that you might be fooled into thinking is equivalent, this life, cy life cycle state. It's like, oh, development, great. This is kind of like snapshots. Like, no, this unfortunately is useless. It's useless because if your spec is in development, you can't use it for anything. So if it's an API spec, you can't import it into Studio. If it's an application, you can't deploy it. So unfortunately, what I was very happy when I saw and thought, oh, I don't need this logic anymore. No, it doesn't work. So uh, to work around that, you'll see here what this does is if you deploy a snapshot version, it will automatically change it to be with a dash timestamp. Now, uh, another feature of EMT, I won't demonstrate that, but uh, it has the ability to publish your application. Instead of deploying to Cloud Hub, you can actually deploy your application to Exchange. And then you can actually deploy from Exchange. So this is perfect for CI CD pipelines so that you can have a build step that publishes to Exchange. And then every deploy step will just say deploy from Exchange. Uh, so this, uh, let's reload this and now you'll see my other API. So this got published automatically and it's going to create the API from here. So. So that's EMT deploys this uh, deployment model, let's just say. Uh, so that's yeah, that's about it uh, for EMT. Um, I don't know if there's any questions uh, that anyone is asking online. No. Okay. Um, I'm just waiting for it, but. If there are any questions, this is the time to ask them. And also, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Maheshwar because um, they wanted to have a shout out online. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you for watching us and following us. Really appreciate uh, it. Oh, uh, sorry. I, I haven't finished. No, no, no. Uh, I just oh, okay. like, it's just okay. like something in the middle. <laughs> okay, okay. Just making sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. And that was it. That's the shout out. I hope they're still watching so they can see the shout out. And that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send them in the comments in LinkedIn or in the chat in Twitch. 
And I will be checking the chat to ask Janik. That's it. <laughs> Sounds good. So, so this is enhancement tools. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the next step, which is properties. So properties, I designed this connector. So this is a connector. Uh, it was added automatically, and this was created to fix two major, major uh, gaps in Mule. So let's look at the first one, and actually, let's actually look at what was added. So in addition to uh, those, uh, any point.json we had here, we now have a properties.yaml. So properties.yaml allow you to define your properties. So let's just say I have uh, my username. Um, so here I can actually add information, as you see, name and description. So I could say, you know, um, oh, let's just call backend username. Um, backend username. Backend or password. So this additional information right now isn't used for anything, but I'm actually planning to leverage this to actually have some nice UI to configure your application based on what you've defined. But right now, it's just yeah, backend password. So you you don't actually need to put the name to just do this. Um, and now here my password. I'm going to set secure true. All right. So now let's have a look. So this is just to define the properties. Now to actually create properties, uh, you it automatically implements a pattern. So to support things like environments. So the first one, the first pattern is properties dash local dot no YAML JSON properties. So it supports a three. Uh, so here I'm going to create local. So Backend um, username Smith uh, password foo. So this is how I would create properties for when I'm running in Studio, and then if it's for environment, so it supports properties dash end dash environment name. So say development dot properties, for example. Uh, or it also supports environment type. So if you have properties which have, say, env type dash sandbox, or no, dash production, for example. So if you have multiple production environment, they all use the same properties, you can do that. So, so it's designed to support environments by default. So now let's look at, so I was saying big gaps. So what's the first big, big gap in Mule? The first big gap is this here. So if I go into my listener and I want to make my listener TLS, so if I want to add a key store here, I cannot use properties. So you, anyone who's been doing mule development knows that very well, is no, here I need a path. So then people have to do clunky CI CD processes where you know if you need to override your your key store, then you need to unzip your file, add the key store, rezip, reupload. It, it's absolutely horrible. Uh, and you, you really shouldn't have to do that. So that's the first big gap that this supports is you can actually inject property key stores, any file, in fact, as uh, as a property. So how does that work is using in the definition, as you saw, there's type. So for example, if I have backend or client key store, then I could just say type file. And now the value, so, so is, this also here supports default. Uh, so you can in this file set a default value. Um, and how you would do it, you could just basically put here a basic base64 encoded value. So if I just, for example, so I'm not going to get a key store because I would have to create it, etc. But I'm just going to do the same thing because it supports technically anything. So so we want encode, um, encode, encode, encode. There we go. So hello world. Encode. So it uses base64 exactly so that it can support binary. So you could inject anything in here. So 
so now what it's going to do is this backend.client key store, it will create an additional property which has dot file appended to your property name. And what it's going to do is actually take this base64 encoded payload, write it to the file system. So decode it, of course, write it to the file system, and then it's going to create another property which is dot file. And that dot file has the path to uh, to the actual um, file. So so then if I wanted to actually use that, I could come here and I could just uh, set the, the key. Did I the, uh, so here in the path, I could do, well, this is technically the trust store, but I could do dot, dot, um, um, what was the call? So no, backend dot key store dot file basically. So I'm, I'll demonstrate this, but uh, just to make things easier, uh, I'm going to use this here. Actually, where did I edit? Uh, I edited this in my API spec. Okay, so this is the right one. So my API spec, I'm just going to set the payload set payload and here I'm going to actually put this property I created. So what was that backend.client store? So now because it is a property that means you can go to runtime manager and you can override it. So backend kiss the client key store and there we go. We can run this. And now, now another little convenience. So one of the things sometimes that can happen during development is you have weird stuff going on, and you're wondering, oh, did this this picking up the wrong you know, endpoint URL. So sometimes you might wonder about, you know, is it really using what you think it's using in terms of properties? So here, as you see, there's a convenience where it's going to actually list all the properties that it has, uh, except the ones that are secure, uh, no, star, star, star. Uh, so here, technically, you see this backend client key store, it should be secure. Um, I haven't put in the secure flag. Um, but if this was a client key store, like I could just go and do secure true. Um, but for example, you saw the my username. So backend username, I can see Smith. Uh, but backend secret, um, I would have to define it in here. Uh, yeah, backend secret would actually show us star, star, star. So. And now, but you see, for example, the one I created, it will have the actual file. Uh, actually, uh, sorry, actually, to see the file, we need a file read. Let me, I'm using the wrong thing. So, file read, so backend, client key store. There we go. So, this takes a path. Okay, back at client key store dot file. That's the right one. So let's rerun. Um, so potentially you could have other use case where this injecting a file is useful, but the the one that pretty much everyone always has is the key store. So your key store is always uh, the, the pain. That's really what this has been designed for. So while this is running, uh, let's go over another convenience that this has. So you've noticed here this HTTP listener. So one of the things you typically need, uh, especially in Cloud Hub, is a key store for your actual API. Uh, but in Cloud Hub, it doesn't matter what the key store is. It doesn't matter that it's a signed certificate because the, the load balancer isn't going to even check. So all you really need is a self-signed certificate. So and that's pretty much a thing that in every project you have to do is create a self-signed certificate, put it into your project. Uh, it's slightly inconvenient. So here, this has a convenience, which is type HTTPS. So type HTTPS is actually going to create a self-signed uh, self key store. 
uh, and which is automatically made available. So here you don't even have to bother. You don't have to actually create a, a key store, put it into your project. Nope. All you need to do is you had type HTTPS and that takes care of it. So in the documentation, I'm not going to go for all of them, but there's different types. So URL is another convenience. So you can just add uh, something like this and it will break it down into dot scheme dot host dot port dot path another convenience uh, so here this one can create a self-signed certificate just by putting ss cert or this is an extension in a way of ss cert which is https so you have an internal flag uh, and then depending it creates all of those properties so the the this internal basically will change if you put internal it will set the port to 8092 uh, otherwise it will put the port to 8082 so grouping so a bunch of conveniences um so now here this should be running so if i do curl localhost 8081 uh, uh what is this api book something no uh, i didn't change a port it, Um, it is running. What port is it running on? Uh, okay, I need to check the port. I didn't change. Eighty eighty one. Well, oh, I typed. That's why. Okay, no. Um, oh, I use a different spec. Okay. List. There we are. Yep. So, see, hello world. So, now this application, if it was deployed on, run, on uh, Cloud Hub, you could just go to Runtime Manager, Base64 encode something else, uh, and put it in, and it would pick it up. So, that's the first big features uh, no, that you couldn't do otherwise. Now, what's the other main feature? So, now let's have a look at the code here. So, here on the right, you'll notice metadata. Now, you might be thinking, hey, look, the metadata works. You might think that because most projects that I've been in, this here doesn't work. Uh, so metadata is broken. I, I can't remember the last time I was on a customer when metadata works. So why does metadata is broken everywhere? So there is a culprit. That culprit is called secure properties. So that's, uh, that's used to encrypt your properties. And most organizations use it. And actually, if you use it, your studio metadata will be broken permanently. So that's, I've tried workarounds and it's a combination of different issues, but the short version is there's nothing that can be done about it. If you use secure properties, your metadata in studio will be broken. So that's, that is a huge productivity killer for developers because uh, then you have to, uh, you know, add logging, et cetera. So that's the other big, big deal in enhanced mule properties. Uh, it supports its own encryption, which doesn't break metadata. Uh, and of course, I've also made it much easier to use. So secure properties is also very inconvenient. You need to download a char. You need to either encrypt each property separately or you need to encrypt all of them. Encrypting all the properties is not a good thing uh, because sometimes you need to check, oh, what was the endpoint that I have? And then if it's encrypted, you need to decrypt it. So it's a pain. So EMT does this much better. Uh, so let's look. So we need a key. So again, if we were using secure properties, you would need to create the key yourself. It needs to be the exact right length. Uh, if it's not, it will fail. Um, so here again, I can just do EMT key gen. And I get a key. 
Now, another thing uh, that this does uh, better than secure properties is um, here you'd have to give that key to everyone. Uh, and everyone would be able to encrypt and decrypt the property, so the developers. Uh, so, for example, if you want, if the developers need to encrypt a production property, well, you, you wouldn't want them to be able to see the production property. So, EMT also can do keygen minus R. So, what this is going to do is actually RSA keys. So, if you use those RSA keys, you could have a private key that you could have, for example, your admin could have this, this private key, uh, and you would deploy the private key on Cloud Hub or you know, on your runtime, but then you could give the developers this public key. So this public key can be used to encrypt, but it cannot be used to decrypt. So this is perfect for, say, production, for example. Um, or you can use the normal one, which is what Secure Property does, which is AES. So, uh, AES or RSA plus AES, technically. So here what you would do is, again, in client, if, so if you were doing with the key store, then you would need to come here and change this and add it to your application, again, out of the box. So developers, instead, what they can do is save a key. So EMT config key, and I'm going to save this key on my machine. So that way, every application then could be using this key or that encryption key here, so um, whichever. So, uh, so that's how you set the key. So I don't need to come to my application. So now let's look at encrypting. So let's open up my local. So by default, this will encrypt local. So EMT encrypt, so you'll see that there's all, oops, I actually wanted to do this first. So you can set up, you know, which this, uh, which definition file you can actually pass the key here. You can actually pass the value to encrypt. So that's, and you can set which file to encrypt or decrypt. So let's now look. So that's it. It encrypts. So you'll notice it encrypted here, this backend password, but it didn't encrypt the username. So this is based on which ones you set secure. So if I needed to check oh, which username is it using, I don't need to actually have to decrypt it. So that's it. It's as simple as EMT encrypt, EMT decrypt. Now, another advantage, another thing you couldn't do with normal secure property placeholders is to actually override the properties with an encrypted property. So if I come here, so if I wanted to... Uh, in run to, uh, wrong one. Uh, so EMT encrypt. So let's just say this is deployed and you wanted to override it, uh, but you wanted to put it here. So technically on Cloud Hub, you wouldn't need to do that because they are, you, you can set that to be hidden. But you could, for example, have an application where the developer didn't set a property to be hidden, or you could not be using Cloud Hub. You could be using RTF. RTF doesn't have this option to always make them invisible. So, so you could do, you could actually put in an encrypted property here. So say, you know, my dot password. Uh, so only quirk. So technically, if I wanted to set my password, uh, that's actually not possible. Uh, so this would, uh, the connector wouldn't be able to see this. So I had to make a little change where I am uh, my password star and um, and that's how you would do this. So my password start would actually have uh, allow you to set an override. So uh, so that's it. Um, now this has something which will change in the future, but um, I, I'm going to move that to a server at some point, but another, useful thing to have is this as a Joux vault. So you can actually set up an integration where you could pull certificates or you could pull secrets from a Joux vault. Uh, so right now I've, I've incorporated this in uh, the connector itself, uh, but I'm planning to actually move to have a server uh, where you could pull things from vault, etc. Um, but but it's here. I'm not going to remove it. So you could actually use this to pull properties from Azure Vault. 
Um, so that's it. So that's the two big uh, the two big deals of properties is to be able to uh, one inject histos to encrypt without uh, breaking your metadata. So there's pretty good documentation. Uh, so this is all open source. So if it's all on GitLab. So if you come in here, you'll see links to the, the project. So there's enhanced your tools, enhanced your properties. Uh, there's also some other things that I've been working on that will be incorporated in here, uh, but they're not quite ready for uh, widespread usage. So we have all the code. So it's open source. You can look at the code. You can submit pull requests, the usual open source stuff. Um, and there's pretty good extensive documentation with all the different parameters. The schemas also for the file, there's a full schema and the different information. So if you're interested, for example, release management via for RTF, uh, this has a process. So for promotion, so I won't go over those. Uh, but that's all the information. Uh, authentication supports all the different. So I showed you EMT login, so that's for a developer. But you can also set all the different uh, client credentials. So bear a token, username, client credentials. So it, it's all there. So that's basically it. Um, if you have, if you try it out and you have any issues, just create tickets. As you can see, there, there's a good number of stuff. So feature requests or bugs, you can come here. So do we have any questions? Nope. But again, people watching, if you are on LinkedIn, you can send a comment. Um, I think there's a chat on the right. And in Twitch, you can just send a message through the chat and let us know if you have any questions. Um, I just have a question. I think mm -hmm. I, you showed the link to the GitHub repo, right? Yes. Uh, so they're here under support tab. There's links to the different repos. OK, awesome. So um, the main, the main, really, the main URL that anyone would want is this docs.enhancedmuletools.com. Yeah. That's the. From here, you can get everywhere else. Yeah, perfect. And are you just accepting like the bugs or the ticket creation, or do you also yeah, yeah, accept yeah, yeah. pull requests? I yeah. do as well. I've I've had people using it, submitting pull requests to fix you know minor issues. So it makes my life easier. I'm <laughs> absolutely open to anyone submitting pull requests, or you know if you don't want to fix things yourself, just uh, yeah describe the bug and then help prioritize yeah. awesome um, all right and also if there's any customer who wants commercial support uh, that's also an option through eontronics Ooh, interesting <laughs> and in here in support there's, there's a link so you can contact wow but, so you you have everything set up <laughs> yes. awesome all righty um so I'm just going to wait some minutes to see if anyone comes with a question. In the meantime, um, you said you created this in? In 2017. 17. So yeah. you were working in Mule 3 at the time, I guess? Yes. That's that was even pre-crowd pre release, which Crowd release was fun. They changed everything, and I had to make massive changes. Like <laughs> when crowd release came out, I literally was all weekend, both days, like twenty hours, just to update everything that had broken. Thankfully, no, that they don't do those kind of things anymore. It's now a lot more stable. All right, that that sounds painful. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that's actually one thing worth mentioning. Uh, I've done, I've always done this having in mind, uh, because th this, of course, talks to all the APIs in Runtime Manager. So I didn't want to be in a situation where uh, if this broke, the customer would be worse off. So I've always done things having in mind the worst case scenario where, what if this breaks? And making sure that always the customers don't end up worse off than they were before. Um, 
so it it's not yeah nothing that in here that even if it stops working because they've changed an api uh it's yeah you, know, you won't be worse off kind of thing got it it sounds super um like everything that you mentioned are pain points that I've also had in my previous projects, like creating all of the client ID and secrets and mm -hmm. everything. The the properties, that was awesome. Uh, like you can just set up the the um, secure property, like true or false, and that's it. That's, yeah. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And then you said like the biggest issue will be to create your first project. And after that, you can, you pretty much set up you just have to yeah. use that one so. and, and and in fact so i'm i'm working right now on on some additional things uh, uh, a tool to help manage software and one of the features i'm planning to add is governance rules which will automatically do things like adding policies so what i'm planning to have is for example you could do a governance rule that oh if my application is exposed to the internet it must have this policy uh, and then it will do that automatically. So I envision that with uh, enhanced mule tools, you will come to a point where actually developers will not set any policies or SLA tiers and all of those things will come from governance rules. So they, they would define metadata like tags or things like that. And then everything else would come from that, but not, not at the moment. <laughs> all right, there's a question. Yannick, mm -hmm. could you share a more rich example of the usage of application deployment tool? Uh, well, that's actually a pretty complete example. Um, there's actually a few things that I have in here which I haven't really used in a while. To be honest, I don't even know if the code works, so I haven't <laughs> documented it. But it, I had alerts at a long time ago. I need to kind of make sure that they working uh but uh, let me see i do think in the project itself uh in enhanced mule tools i have an example i yeah so this one has a bit more so see actually here you can see i'm setting fields i'm setting exchange tags i'm setting categories so this is for when you are actually creating the exchange asset uh, from here. Uh, so you could also put pages in here. It doesn't show. This is old, so you can ignore this part. This is from now we're doing things differently before. Uh, no, th this example actually is pretty complete. The one I just created uh, because we have, yeah, we have API. So we have SLAT, we have policies. Uh, mostly the additional things I could add are things it guesses automatically uh so api so i i could define the asset so here in the asset you know as you see you know i could add tags i could add portal pages could add the icon fields description uh th this is actually as complete as it gets for and now. can we find that example in github somewhere yep uh Right here. So under uh, Enhanced Mule Tools example, then, then there's several examples in here. Mm. Uh, some of those might be oldish um, in project RAML. So yeah, so this shows with the RAML in the project. This shows it pulling. So yeah, if someone is curious, they can come in here. Uh, but I, I do have pretty good documentation. Uh, so in here, you'll see uh, different examples. Uh, there's also all the additional features I didn't go over, so like variables. So you could actually, so if you needed something in, so some endpoints, you know, you want to inject that as a, pro, a variable, you can. It supports, even has like some capitalized lowercase. So there's a, there's quite a few. Uh, so here's actually a pretty big example. So you see portal pages. So these actually contain pages, categories, fields, icon. So this is actually a much more complete example. So implementation URL, consumer URL, tags, policies, accessed by, yep, th this example actually is even more complete. Um, default values, 
So it explains to you how where the default values come from, assets. So this this is actually a better place to look at examples. API auto discovery policies. Uh, so here I'm showing how you can find it. I'm also showing how to do this the hard way via the browser. Um, SLAT is application client. So, you, no, I didn't show that, but you can put description and URL, API access. Yeah, for example, you, if you have labels, it supports it. Uh, what I don't support right now is multiple APIs. Um, and here it shows what gets injected. So the documentation is pretty extensive. I've you know, I, I've been in the open source world for a long time, and I'm quite aware that um, a, 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 an open source project without documentation is kind of useless. <laughs> so uh, like most developers, I am not a fan of doing documentation, <laughs> but I, I did uh, put in uh, the painful effort of <laughs> documenting this pretty extensively. So. Um, you, you get the most information you need. Uh, and here the reference docs are a must. So you have all the, the different commands in Enhanced Mule Tools and again, Maven, all the different options with you know, everything it does. And the schema. So there's a full schema in here. Perfect. You see, um, it's long. There's another question. What technologies or tools were used to develop it? So uh, Java. So EMT is two things. EMT is a Java command line tool and a Maven plugin. So Maven plugins are Java. You don't even get a choice about it. Um, so if in here you'll come see there's different sub projects. So there's Maven plugin, there's lib, which shares between CLI so CLI and Maven both share the same code base on the lib. Um, and uh, for the connector, again, you have no choice about that. Uh, this is Java also <laughs> as a connector. So it's a Java. So it's a custom property uh, manager. Uh, so this is much smaller. Uh, uh, so Enhanced Mule Tools is a pretty large code base. Uh, like I said, many, many years of work and God knows how many commits. Um, but yeah, uh, this is actually a, a bit smaller. So this is actually well, smaller-ish. Yeah. All right. Um, I just have a curious question. Why did you prefer GitLab over GitHub? Well, so this actually was before on GitHub. So if you if you go to GitHub, uh dot com you'll actually find uh where was that i opened it earlier no um so if we look back at my old old version so this used to be called any point tools uh and then i remembered oh wait trademarks maybe i shouldn't call these <laughs> any point tools uh, so here we have the really old version that starts back in 17 so like commits no 18. so why did i switch to github uh github is more full featured basically i mean so uh, gitlab so so gitlab has ci cd uh, so github i mean github nowadays has kind of ci cd but it, it's not anywhere as powerful um to be honest a friend of mine uh, uh, an old friend mentioned to me who was using it uh i gave it a try but yeah, you know, between GitLab and say Bitbucket, they're pretty similar. I could have gone for both. Um, I I like the fact that GitLab had a lot of uh, integrations for like with Kubernetes. So this this stuff looks oh that this is interesting. Terraform. So it it's a bit more full featured than Bit uh, Bitbucket, uh, and a lot more full featured than GitHub. So no comparison of there. Uh, I've actually been thinking of syncing to GitHub uh, so that you actually have here a copy uh, for people who use GitHub. So yeah, that that's really the main reason. Got it. Mm, makes sense. <laughs> so there's, yeah, that's CI, CD pipelines. Uh, I've also got uh, like pipelines for different, uh, for Mule. Uh, so for example, Azure DevOps for 
uh, I haven't put them actually in here. There, there's other projects, if anyone is curious, as you see, there's not just those two. Uh, I've got like an installer. So this is actually for on-prem. So it's an, a tool uh, that you can use to configure on-prem. Uh, now that one is not documented, so use you know, use at your own risk. Uh, I've got a JSON uh, a JSON layout. So for example, if you use uh, if you've ever had the use case of wanting to send logs to Splunk, you'll want to use JSON. Um, now certain people might use JSON connector. Now I one thing I must say is do not do that, please, please do not use JSON the JSON logger to send logs to Splunk. That's a very, very bad idea uh, because you lose all the logs which aren't generated by your JSON connectors. The correct way to send JSON logs to, uh, to Splunk or Elk is to use a JSON layout, a log4j layout. Now, when I say all you need to do is that, is that's easier said than done. Uh, in theory, it should be easy because if you go log4j JSON layout, you'll see, hey, that's there by default, so you can just use that, right? That's what you think. There's there's actually multiple of them. If you come in here, you'll see, hey, they have uh, they have four of them. Yay! Uh, bad news on Mule, uh, they don't work. So JSON layout breaks because there's a different version of JSON. JSON template layout breaks and i don't even know why uh, i i didn't dig into it it just doesn't work so uh, another thing if you look in here is i created where is it uh i think it's this one no not this one oh actually no that's not part of enhanced mule so that's actually part of the open source uh as you see, that's, I've also got quite a few other things in open source. So that's all my open source project. So yeah, I've got a JSON layout. So this one actually is worth a call out because this one is designed for Mule. So this one does not break in Mule. So you can use this and it will generate logs, you know, designed to work for Elk Splunk. So this actually would be worth moving. I'm, I'm actually planning to see if I can bundle that in a connector. Um, so, but right now it's not there. So a bunch of stuff. If people are curious, you can come into here and have a look. Um, I even have actually, so I've removed that. I'll probably bring it back to life. But uh, I have uh, like a templating system. Uh, so that you can use with like EMT, you know, application create. So that's what it used to be. So now that it's not there anymore, it's not there, right? Yeah, no, I removed it. Uh, but you could use this to actually create a wall project and pass parameters. So you could, it would ask you, you know, oh, do you have, you know, do you want an API or not? And do you want this, that? So th this, for example, uses Genesis. So I have a, a templating system. So it's kind of like Genesis templating. There we go. Uh, so this is kind of like um, uh, Maven archetypes, but much more powerful. Maven archetypes is super basic. So a bunch of stuff. I'll let people go over it. Uh, any other questions? Nope. I think that's it. All right. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me here. and. If anyone has any questions, I'm also on the the community Slack, which I, I do believe everyone has access to it. You don't have to be a mentor, right? Um, you have to be like a mentor, an ambassador, or a meetup leader to be there. To be on the community? On okay. the Slack, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. So then, okay, I guess no people can't get there. So anyway, if you have any questions or issues, feel free to uh, add stuff in here. Um, yeah, and then you know, if someone wants to actually talk, just yeah, we can uh, exchange emails. Oh, there's another quick question. Do you still have time? Yeah, 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 yeah. plenty of time. Okay, uh, which are your main motivation of saying no to use JSON logger? Uh, so that so the JSON logger it's a connector, so as a connector, it can only put information in the message. So if you look at an application, 
So I wouldn't quite say no. Uh, my point is not so much saying no to JSON logger, but it would be no to the abuse of JSON logger. Because if you look here, so this is a log record. And when it writes a log record, it has all of this information. And then here, here, this is the message, right? So technically, the JSON connector can only change this here. So it can only change the message. Now, if, if all you want to do is use the JSON logger to generate a JSON message, then that's fine. Go ahead, no problem with that. The problem is what some people do with JSON logger is they'll come in log4j, they'll come into here this log4j.xml, and then as a horrible hack, they'll remove all of this stuff and they'll just have the message. And now here, it will look like every line is actually a JSON line, but that will only work for the logs that are generated by the JSON logger. So all the other logs that are generated by actually other connectors, they will actually lose all of that information. You'll lose the log level, you lose the timestamp. So you've just lost all other information. So that that's not good. That that's really bad. So I, I'm against the abuse <laughs> of JSON logger, uh, which is very, very common. So the way to do JSON logs in log4j is not to do this hack. No, the way you create JSON logs is you use a JSON logger. So if you were, you know, for example, if you were using not in Mule, if you were not in Mule, you could actually use one of those. So if you were not in Mule, you would just come here and you would like, let's get something like that. So if I was in a non-Mule application, I would replace this and this would get me JSON logs the right way. But in Mule, this doesn't work. So you have to use the one I created. Or if you can find some other one that works in Mule. Uh, to be honest, I, I originally, I'm not a big fan of rewriting the will. Uh, I'm not one of those persons who will you know, rewrite it just because to have my own. No, I, I, I first tried all those I could find and none of them would work in Mule. And that's why in the end, I ended up creating my own JSON layout. But that's, that is the official correct way in log4j to do JSON logs, which is a JSON layout. Now, as a note, um, you can't do that in RTF. So RTF doesn't let you change this. Uh, so, you, so you can't, you're locked out of here. Uh, so I have actually some ideas around how to work around that limitation, um, but I haven't yet implemented. So that's something I might bring in at some point. Uh, but right now in RTF, you can't do JSON. That's a short version. All right. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the motto, all this stuff I've been developed. So since I've been working actually as uh, a MuleSoft consultant, uh, really my objective of developing all of this was to be able to go to a customer and not be embarrassed. <laughs> That's really because all some of those limitations where, oh, you have to do all of that by hand. It's like, no, 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 no. It is, you, you don't want it's. It, that that will setting up API manager by hand just doesn't scale. It's fine if you're doing a little demo and you're showing one API, but in a large scale project with a hundred APIs and this API talks to those five other APIs and those five other APIs, five to thought then other APIs. No, 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 that's just, that's just insane. Uh, we were there and no, so that that's why I ended up spending. I I didn't spend all the hours to create enhanced mule tools for you know my own fun. They've been really done because without it, it was horribly painful. So I I right now I I always tell the customers, you no, know, it's open source. Are you willing to use open source or not? So there's always all those different aspects. But personally, I would not want to do a a mule soft project without those features. 
Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I hope the product team watches <laughs> and do something yes. about it. I absolutely, yes. I've like, for example, if the product team watches these, like, please make this useful. Uh, the, this here, this published new asset right now, this is useless. So you can't use this for any pro practical purpose. Now, I have a workarounds in Enhanced Mule Tools again. So for example, for applications, there's, there's a promote command. So I, I've kind of be able to build in snapshots on top of the limitations. But to be honest, I would be absolutely very happy to go and delete my workarounds uh, and have this officially work correctly. Uh, you know, this here is what people should be using. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> All righty. Oh, actually, it's just a small last note uh, because for some customers, uh, for some people that might matter. So, uh, so this EMT login that I showed earlier uh, is so it, this requires a server side element. There's no working around it. Um, so I have a lambda function on AWS that does that. Now, certain organizations might be might like for security reasons not want to use that. So I actually have a mule application that uh, you could deploy on your server uh, that does that. So right now I haven't published it yet. So if anyone wants that mule application to do this EMT login, uh, just get in touch uh, and I can provide that. I haven't quite decided that one. So I'm, I'm planning to some of those things will, uh, I'm going to add some commercial add-ons beyond this. So this will stay open source. I'm not going to change that, but I'm building additional capabilities like what I mentioned before. So have governance rules that decide what policies uh, are going to be applied. So that's going to be a commercial add-on. Um, but right now, for example, if you wanted that Mule application, it's, uh, I'm, I'm giving that away for free. Just you know, send me an email on, on here, uh, on this email for commercial support and I can give. Uh, that application just to do the authentication. Uh, and it's a mule application, so you can deploy it on your servers. Sweet. All righty. I guess that's all the questions. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Yannick. This You're was welcome. awesome. <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me here. And uh, everyone, have a good week and uh, happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Yeah. Just right before everyone goes, remember to go to twitch.tv slash mulesoft underscore community. I see that two people are following us now from the stream. So thank you for following us. Um, and this is the last stream of the year. We will come back on January 17, Tuesday 17. Um, so take these four weeks of holiday from us <laughs> and we will come back on January. Um, been asking this for long. Is it possible to deploy applications to Heroku? Jani, do you mean like, not in Docker mode though, do you mean like in Flex Gateway or are you asking about the EMT product? Well, will you answer that? Um, uh yeah, go to Twitch and uh, you can also see the schedule. If you're not sure when we're coming back, it will tell you that we will come back in January 17, or you can also go to like the schedule type uh, tab and it will tell you our calendar when we're coming back. So yes, there all of the recordings are gonna be there. This recording is gonna be there. So uh, just go there, create an account in Twitch, follow us, you will receive notifications as soon as we are live. And you can also see all of the previous recordings. And Jenny answered, like installing Mule Runtime on Heroku. Uh, so installing Mule Runtime on Heroku, uh, I have this installer tool, um, but that you have to be on the server. So this is something you run on the server. Um, so yes, if that's what you meant. Um, there, there's no documentation though for it. Well, limited documentation. Uh, where is it? Um, yeah, so there's this enhanced mule installer. There, there's a readme. 
Um, so it's a jar file. Now I don't know if you could do that, use that for Heroku. Uh, I've never seen uh, runtimes deployed on Heroku, so that I have no idea. Uh, I, actually, something worth mentioning. I haven't personally used it. I've built that feature actually for uh, a customer. Um, but if you wanted to actually uh, set up properties, but without a mule application, so for HTTP proxy. Uh, so if you just want a proxy, you can also actually use this, uh, even if you don't have a REST endpoint. So this actually, uh, if you come here into uh, API asset, so just to type, so see this type HTTP. So you can use that to create an HTTP endpoint. So, uh, there's a there's a provision. So if you look at the documentation, there's also a provision step. So I don't know if that's related to the question, um, but there's yeah different ways of using this. So I don't know if it will work for the use case. All right. And then Muhammad says we have this JSON JSON issue in RTF. <laughs> that's uh -huh. a hint to how to solve it. that problem. Okay, so. Uh, here's what my plans are. So <laughs> I am um, my, my most likely next addition here, in addition to tools and properties, is probably going to be logging. So what I'm planning to do with logging in the connector is have the connector uh, at runtime. So you add a connector to your code, and in that connector, you'll be a checkbox saying enable JSON logs. Uh, and probably like set up send logs to URL. Uh, and then basically what I'm planning to do, uh, I haven't tried it out. So this is just a educated guess based on how I know Log4j works, which is at runtime change the configuration. Because but basically in here, uh, this one you can't touch because they will override. So my plan is in my connector to actually change the configuration so that it can generate JSON logs and send it to some server. Um, so that's a plan. I don't know if that will actually work or there's going to be limitations, but uh, in theory, it should. All right. And then Jani says, trying it right away. We'll connect with Janik later on. All right, cool. <laughs> Perfect. So yes, I guess that is it. Um, we did the Twitch thing and I announced the vacation. So we're pretty much done. Thank you so much, Yannick. This is awesome. And I'm sure like a lot of muleys will start using it because <laughs> it's yes. super useful. <laughs> yes. If you want to get in touch, actually, just use that in that email. I mean, it's technically you no know, sales at the Antronix, but if you send an email here, it'll get to me. Uh, if you're actually a MuleSoft consultant, so if you have access to a MuleSoft Slack, you can get to me there too. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So happy holidays, everyone. I am also going on three-week vacation, so I will see you on January. <laughs> Sounds good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.